Hello and welcome back. Today we are going to talk about support vector machines and we are going to see how R can handle support vector machines. In order to use support vector machines in, um, in R, we need to install a new package and the package we need to install is called E1071. That's a very uh, weird name. The name came from uh, the room in um, the room in Berlin University where um, where this package was being introduced so you need to install this this package first is E1071 uh, I think it's still working on it install packages E1071 yeah it shows that it's been downloaded and uploaded and by the way in today's lecture I'm going through uh, the lecture notes step by step instead of typing things and just going over the com commands here because um, I think it's a long lecture if I want to type it, it would take a, a long time so let's go over the um, lines step by step so the first thing I want to do is just create a random um, sample by which I can test support vector machines on so the first step is to create some random variables I'm interested to you to first introduce 40 normal latest uh, 40 observations from uh, from standard normal distribution and the standard normal distribution has mean 0 and a standard deviation 1 and I want to put it in two columns so I want to produce 40 random numbers from normal distribution putting in two columns so we will have uh, two columns each column will have um, two observations uh, each column will have 20 observations so let's look at the outcome of X so let's look over X so X will look like this it, it has two variables so each each row will have two variables because we have 40 observations in total we we put it into two columns so each column will have 20 observations so these are my uh, X's and X1's and X2's. So for first observation, my X1 is negative 0.62, second observation 0.9, and so on and so forth. So these are just randomly generated numbers. And let's also generate um, random Y's. Um, so, so I just generate random Y's. Uh, let's look at uh, different outcomes of Y. So the first 10 elements of Y will be negative 1. The second 10 elements of y will become 1. See that? Uh, the first 10 elements are negative 1. The second 10 elements are 1. Now I want to make sure, uh, now I want to make some um, changes to that and what I want to do is to change the values of y that, that are 1 which are value 11 to 20. Um, I want to add 1 value to these observations from 11 to 20 based on that so I, I just I don't want to change the first 10 observations of X I only want to change the second 10 observations of X because these are the only ones that have Y1 okay so the way you do it is pretty simple in R you just write Y X of Y's when you are 1 we will be replaced by x so y is equal to 1 plus 1 that means for the places that y was 1 which is um, which are uh, 11th place to 20th place we add, add one value to x and add it to x so let's see the outcome so, so, so just focus on let's say 20th observation was 0.5 and 0.7 as you can see here now after this uh, change let's look at the 20th observation it became 1.59 and 1.6 so it added one value to both of them we do it to separate um, these 10 observations from the earlier 10 observations okay so let's plot what we have let's plot x based on different colors uh, so let me explain what this does it says plot x by the colors of y so when y was negative 1 it will use color 4 which is red when x has y, when y has value 1 which is 10th to 20th observation it use color 2 which is blue so let's plot that so the random numbers we created now would look like this 
we have 10 blue observations, 10 red ones. And as you can see, since we added um, one to the cases where uh, y was equal to one, we see the clear distinction of x1 and x2. And it's not hard to see it's a line that separates this. This is an error we see, that's fine. But, but, or, uh, or, uh, but what we want is to find a line and support vectors to separate this uh, space into two categories. So, so let's put all x's and y's in a data frame and call it that. That will be our data now. So that has the first two elements will be the first two elements of x, and the last part is a categorical value of y. So let's look at that. So that are the, the first two elements are, came from x. The third element is the category that it belongs to. Okay. So in order to use support vector machines, we need to use library E1071. So we are done with just simulating our data, creating a data set that has negative one and one category. Now we want to use um, our support vector machine to solve it. If you, if you just want to use support, uh, a simple support vector machine that's just linear, you have to use function SVM. You first show what is your categories. What are your categories? We have two categories and they are in my y variable. They are in my y variable here, right? So these are my y variables. So this is, these are my categories, they're outputs. Then you regress it on x1 and x2. If you just wanted to refer to them and x1 and x2, you should write that dollar $x1, that dollar $x2. But here, since we want to regress it in both parts, we just put dot, that means both x1 and x2. The data we are going to use is that. So data is equal to that. The kernel type we are going to use is linear because that's that's what we want. Later on, i show you how to use radial and polynomials. So let's, let's stick with linear one. And linear, you have to define the cost that you uh, let it have. So and always set scale to false um, so that uh, it understands you need to scale it or not. So since we just use the standardized data, we, we didn't need this scan. So SVM fit is a support vector machine model on Y variable, which was our output and my inputs. So let's look at the plots. One of the great things about uh, this library is that when you plot your support vector machine fit, your model on your data, it shows the uh, support vector issue shows us. Um, it doesn't look quite linear in this case, but believe me, it's line as just the way the plot works here. It just, um, it looked at different meshes and just connect the meshes and it's no surprise that it doesn't look quite linear, but but that's, that's line. It tried its best to show a line to you. And these X's here are support, uh, are, 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 are elements of my support vector. So as you can see in this graph, so anything before this is blue, anything after this is categorized as red, and as we can see there is one observation right here. This observation is misclassified, everything else is pretty much classified and, and our support vectors would be a line parallel to our um, boundary here and another line which is uh, right here. Okay. So that's how we just plot the support vectors. Let's look at the elements of the SVM feed. So, so, so the elements of our support vector can be retrieved by just writing SV, uh, your model dollar sign index. So it says my first observation, second observation, fifth observation, seventh observation, fourteenth, sixteenth, and seventeenth observation are in our 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 support vectors. So my first observation was negative 0.6 and 9.91. Uh, second observation was also clear, and so on and so forth. So so you can get the elements of support vector by just writing SVM fit, which was our model dollar sign index. It will give me the indices of the observations that become that became support vector. You can also look at the summary of that. 
Um, there is not that much you can get from summary. The only things that are interesting is that it has seven support vectors. So we, we in the support vector index, we found there are seven observations that vary in support vectors. So you can have this uh, number here. It says four of the first category, four of my first category class, uh, four of the observation of my first category variant support vector and three from my second category. And we again, we saw it here. Four of the first category was here, three of the second category. It says we have two classes, and our classes are uh, indexed by a negative one and one. So uh, well, one thing we can do is to change the parameter that we can play with, and that is cost. So before we used cost 10, now let's change cost to 0.1 and see how does that work. If we try to change our cost to cost 1, you see our boundary will change and way more observation will be in our support vector. In comparison to before, before we only had 7 observations uh, in, in our support vector. Now we have way more. So let's, um, let's look at the summary of uh, let's look at the summary of new one, new fit. You can see, oh, oh, that is SVM fit. Okay. okay. Yeah, as you can see, there's 16 observations now in support vector, which is significantly more than that. So by, play, by playing with cost, there will be more and more observation in your support vector. But what is the best cost to use? In order to use the best cost, we have to use cross-validation. So the way you deal with cross-validation is pretty simple in support vector machine, and the function you use thing is called tune. Tune is a function that, um, that is used for cross-validation of support vector machines. You first need to set your seed to a random number that you're interested in. So tune is a function. The first thing you need to do is to introduce what, which model you're interested to tune your, um, tune your functions upon. So here we're using SVM because we are in the realm of support vector machines. So, so mo our model type is support vector machine. Within the support vector machine, we have Y variables, which are our outcomes, which we regressed on everything else. The data we're using is our that data, the one that we just created, the simulated data that we created. The kernel we are going to use is linear. And, and, and one thing wonderful about it is you just need to show what variable you want to change for cross-validation. You can have more than one or just one variable. So, so you have to put it in ranges. So the ranges would be the variables needed to be changed. And the, the variable that we change can be a list of many things. Here, we, the list is only cost. Cost will be changed from 0 0.001, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 10, 200. So these are the values of cost we want to change. And all of them are cost. So that's why we said, okay, the ranges that we want to change is upon cost. And this cost could be, can get these values. So the team will take care of that. And I think the, um, the default is tenfold cross validation. So let's look at the summary of these tune parameters. So in tune out, when you take it, uh, the um, summary of this tune out, what you get is first, what method was used? This is the tenfold cross validation. We were right about that. It says, what was the best pr parameter that gave me the, the best performance? And it said, for cost 0.1 among all the co costs we put here, it did the best model. So the more best model were, were related to cost point one. It's extremely easy. You don't even need to look at uh, the uh, the plots to get it. It, it automatically gives you this uh, value. So cost point one became our best model, and it's very easy to get the best model from from this Q naught function. What you the only thing you need to do is Right, tune out, which was the name of, uh, which was the variable we put our tune 
function in dollar sign best model it, it puts the best model inside best model so when you get a summary of best model it says okay the best model is the linear model has class 0.1 it has 16 support vectors and I think what you see here is as is that best model and and so on and so forth so so it's very easy to extract the information on best model just to put to, just to, to write dollar sign best model to get the attributes of the best model they call it best model uh, now let's focus on predicting so 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 far we've learned a couple of things so let's review the things we've learned so far the, so far we learned how to create some random numbers I think you knew how to do it before deal deal with that before we we learned how to work with linear support vectors um, with, with kernels that are linear we learned how to find the best model, how to tune cost. So we use tune function. And we learned how to get into the best model of all our cross-validated models. So now let's uh, focus on something new and let's, let's fo focus on prediction. So, um, so let, instead of just uh, using our training data to predict what is happening on our test. So let's just create some some new data and that, let's call them test data. So our test data is again created based on a normally distribute uh, standard normal distribution with 40 observations we put them in two columns so we have 20 observations in total um, so, so my X test so if we want to just see what X test would look like sorry x test so there are 20 observations they have x1 and x2s let's also introduce um, y test which is our outcome and, and let's do a random thing um, here let's sample from negative 1 and 1 20 of them and let replacement happens if you do not write write replacement equal to true what will happen is that it will it can only choose two of these values negative 1 and 1 after that, it will be exhausted because there's, there are not 20 observations between negative 1 and 1. There are only two outcomes. So, so we, we, we let replacement happen. So let's look at the value of y test now. So y test can, get only, uh, can only get values of 1, negative 1. Since we let replacement happen, you can see that there are many negative 1s and many 1s. So as before, let's add one value to the cases that test uh, y test is equal to uh, 1. So my, for my first category, I add one value to x1 and x2. And let's create test data frame as my x test, the ones that we created and we, we manipulated, and new y's. So our test data is now composed of x1s and x2s and their categories. So we know that uh, our test data as this, uh, so my first one, has actual outcome of 1. We know the second observation has actual negative 1, but let's see how my best model works on these predictions. So in order to use prediction, you use predict model. And remember we defined best model was the model that came from two, uh, a cross-validated model on best dot model. So that is my best model. So I want to predict my test data on my best, best model. So this is the model I want to use, and this is the data I'm going to use. So Y prediction has the predictions that you are interested in. So let's look at Y prediction. It says, for example, it predicts my, mo my first observation belongs to one. See, my first observation was actually belong to one, so that was the correct prediction. The three next observation belong to negative one. As you can see, the second and third observation actually belong to negative one, but this one was misclassified, and so on and so forth. So now we want to see that in the table. We want to see what is, what is the table, the confusion matrix of actual predictions in comparison, actual observations in comparison to our predictions. So the table we are going to use has y prediction as predictions and, and uses 
y variable of our test data for truth. Um, so one thing to remember here is um, the, the way you just refer to um, prediction is by calling predict and the way you, you refer to truth or actual things is by using truth in the table. Okay. So y prediction was my predictions, that's why I put it in the predictions in the table and truth was test data of y. So let's look at the confusion matrix here. So as you can see in this confusion matrix, we only misclassified one observation. 11 times that we predicted 11, uh, negative 1, it was actually negative 1. 8 times we predicted 1, it was actually 1. And only one time we mispredicted things. You could just call this anything you wanted. Uh, you could just call predict as, um, as, let's say, actual observations, then your table will be we we'll show you actual observations here, okay? So there's nothing, uh, nothing important about predicting truth here. But what is important is that we, we wanted to show why the, our prediction about y versus actual observations of y. Now let's move on to radial kernels and also polynomials. I'm going to explain what radial kernels are. Sorry, well, how to use radial kernels and how to play with the parameters that are assigned to radial kernels. And as, as you can remember, we had a gamma term and cost term that were, um, that were related to such kernels. Uh, for polynomials, you can also use the same thing. The only thing we change is that instead of fixing gamma and cost, you have to fix degree of polynomial. We have this uh, component in it. So I'm going to focus on radial kernels. Using polynomials is easy. You just need to make some adjustments using kernel as polynomial and, and use degree component. So let's focus on radial components. So in order to do that, let's um, create some interesting variables. Um, and I explain what, what we're going to do in a bit. So let's set our C to 1. And now let's um, produce a matrix of size 2 to 200, 2 times 200. So two, sorry, 200 observations with two columns. So I've created 400 random variables with two columns. So I want to do something special here. Um, let's assume my first category is different from my second category in two ways. The first way is the places that has more than, um, which contains x's that are two values more than um, the first category. And the second category is the values that are two values less than together. For example, for example, let's assume um, we want to we wanna, uh, find medium class people. So medium class people, or better say medium in income, income people, are the ones who are worse than high income people, better than low income people. So here, I'm adding two to first 100 observations. Okay, so I'm adding two to first 100 observations. And I am subtracting two from 101st to 150 observations. So these are high income people, these are low income people. So my the first 100 people will be the ones that have high income. Second 50 people are, are the ones who have low income and the rest will be the medium class. So so, so our goal is just to extract medium re, medium level people from um, or middle class people from non middle class. And so the first 150 observations belongs to non-middle class, and let's signify that by 1. So the first 150 observations are the ones who are middle class. The second 50 observations, which are the ones that we didn't manipulate, are the ones who were uh, medium class. So let's look at why now. So as you can see, the first 150 observations are medium class, uh, non-medium class, non-middle class, and the last 50 observations were high-income people. So among those 
100 people, 100 people are high-income high people, 50 people were low-income people. So let's attach all these values to each other. And let's plot it based on the color of Y. So, so Y can be one or two, so two colors. So let's plot it and see how it looks like. So as you can see, we have low-income people here. We have middle class in the middle and uh, high-income people at the end. So these are 100 observations here, 50 observations in the middle, and 50 observations here. So as you can see, there is no line that can separate these two values. So we have to use some nonlinear shapes. And as we discussed in earlier uh, lectures, in order to do that, we need to use either uh, radial kernels or polynomials. So here we, we are just going to focus on polynomials. And just for the sake of this example, let's, um, uh, let's uh, divide our data into training and test data. So our training will be the 100 observations from test data we have, uh, from the whole observations that we have. So in order to run a kernel function, we just need to use SVM. So that's the name of the function, SVM on my y variables, because that was part of my um, data frame, on x1 and x2. The data we are using is just the part of that DAT data, which is my training. The kernel I'm going to use is radial. Let's fix gamma to 1 and cost to 1 as well. So, and let's plot my SVM feed. To what the, this model based on the data I get and training set. So it looks like this. As you can see, it did a pretty good job in, in separating my, my uh, lower class people from uh, middle class people from high class and low class people. So we see these couple of guys were misclassified as middle class. Um, this guy is also misclassified as non-middle class, but indeed was middle class. And as you can see, the support vectors look like something like this here. And also there is a support vector here at the end and here. Uh, so one thing we need to do is to see what will happen if we change costs, for example. So here we, we just run ran our model based on cost 1. Let's run a new model based on cost um, 10,000 or 100,000. So let me make it 10,000. Or maybe if I stick to 100,000. Okay, so, so that's the same model just by 100,000 observations. So let's plot it and see how it looks like. As you can see, it, when we increased our cost, we let it become way more flexible here. So we went after individual observations. So as you can see here, we have small islands here, which is not that cool because um, as you saw in original data, we had a very significant um, uh, class in the middle and it was very easily separatable. So as you can see, such a cost didn't work, but how can we find the best cost model? Again, the way you use, uh, the way you, um, the way you compare the best model, the way you, you evaluate different models is through using Tune model and cross-validation. So Tune does cross-validation for us. And the components of that is very, very much the same as the components we explained earlier. So you, you should first introduce what model you're going to use, you're, you're using is SVM. You should introduce what you're what you're uh, regressing on what, and here we are regressing Y on everything else. The data we are using is training data set. The kernel we are going to use is radial, and here you list all the things you want to change. So here we have two parameters to tune. One is cost, the other one is gamma, gamma for radial. For, for polynomials, you just, you would write degree here. So, so, to, so in ranges, you put the list of things you want to change. So in, the, in this list, I want to change cost. And the things inside cost I want to check is 0 0.1, 1, 10, 100, 1,000. 
I also want to change gamma from 0.5 up to 4. So these are the things we are changing. So let's run this tune function. And let's look at the summary of tune out. It says the best performing mod model has cost 1 and is gamma 1. Again, if you want to have access to this model, you just write uh, time, tune out best model. Maybe just for the sake of this example, let's, let's plot um, tune out best model on our training data and see how it would look like. As you can see, we see these clear distinctions, and it almost clearly, um, almost exactly divided my data into tuning and uh, onto middle class and non middle class classes. But one thing we need to do is to look at uh, how it is doing on test data. So let's define test as whatever training is not. And I, I tried to just uh, minimize writing notation maybe I should have just uh, introduced it another way but but I think that's okay um, so let's define true as the values of my test data on y so values of my test data on y are truth we want to show it in comparison to prediction and to do it we need to find prediction method our prediction method uses the best model of tune out and you use test data as new observations. So news is that data on my test data. So if you run this, it will show you a table of true observations versus prediction. So, so 54 times truth was class 1, we predicted 1. 6 times the truth was class 2, we predicted Okay, in my test data. 23 times it was class 1, we classified it as 2, and 17 times it was class 2, and we classified it as class 1. So, so our overall error is 17 plus 23 divided by 54 plus 6. Ah, okay, I didn't need to make one over here. So my overall Oh, sorry, 54 plus 6, okay, I made a mistake, plus 6 plus 17 plus 23, okay. So my overall error was around 40%. It's significant, it's, it's very high actually, uh, but that's, that's the best error we can get in my test data. So let's review the things we covered by now. The first thing we discussed was linear kernels. Here we need to, to, to uh, work on cost. And we show that if you want to tune it based on cost, you just need to list all the costs you want to work on. Then we focused on kernel radial kernels, and we show that there are two things to be um, tr there are two things needed to be tuned. And the way you do it again, putting all tuning parameters inside a list for ranges. So here we we wanted to tune in the cost of gamma. And one cool thing about tune function is that whenever you want to get access to the best model, you just write tune the doubt, dollar sign, best model. It gives you the best thing that is out there. Um, SVMs are very powerful nowadays. It's, they're being used all over the place. And uh, uh, that's it. I'm very happy that we covered that part as well. I hope you had fun with it. Thank you. See you next time.